Now we have digested our carbohydrates into their monosaccharide forms. Now we need to absorb them. Now let's think about this kind of from the problem perspective. We have to be able to absorb these monosaccharides across two layers. First, we have to absorb the monosaccharides from the lumen of the intestine across this luminal side of the enterocyte. And then we have to be able to absorb those monosaccharides again across the basolateral side of the cell um, in order for the monosaccharides to then get into the blood vessel. Because keep in mind, if we just absorb a monosaccharide across the luminal side and then it gets stuck in that enterocyte, we shed these enterocytes every three to four days so that monosaccharide would never actually get into our body. So we have to be able to absorb across both the luminal side as well as across the basolateral side. Now, in order to, um, to do this absorption, we are going to use two different methods of transport. One method is called secondary active transport, which we'll talk about in more detail in a second, as well as facilitated diffusion. Now, this secondary alpha, uh, active transport relies on a sodium-potassium gradient across our cell. And so in a slide or so, we're going to talk about um, more detail about what that gradient is and how we maintain it. Um, so, but first, so to get across the luminal side, we'll be e either using secondary active transport or facilitated diffusion. And then in order to get across this basolateral side, we'll be using facilitated diffusion. And once that monosaccharide has crossed the basolateral side, it can then just be, um, the blood vessels are permeable to monosaccharides. So they can just immediately enter into the blood vessels and travel from there. Okay, so I've alluded to the fact that we have these sodium-potassium concentration gradients across our cells. So remember that a concentration gradient is going to be a difference in concentration of a compound or an ion across a cell membrane. And when we have differences in concentration gradients, that is a way that we store potential energy. Because um, these, these uh, solutes, they want to be equal. They, want to, they strive for equilibrium across the, the membrane. So when we have differences in concentration gradients, that is a source of potential energy. So in general, we are going to have a higher concentration of potassium ions inside the cell. I'm representing potassium ions as these kind of teal colored triangles. Um, so the inside of a cell will have a high concentration of potassium. The outside of the cell will have a high concentration of sodium. And I'm representing these so the sodium as um, these purple dots. So the, those are the sodium ions. Now, how do we maintain these differences in concentration gradients? It is through a sodium-potassium exchange pump. And so that's what I'm showing you here. So this is a um, protein transporter that uh, spans the membrane. And what this protein transporter does is it will take three sodiums that were in, whoops. It will take three sodiums that were inside the cell, bind them, and then perform a conformational change so we can spit those sodiums out, um, spit them out of the cell, and then it will take uh, two potassiums that are in the outside of the cell, bind them, perform a conformational change so it can spit those potassium ions into the cell. And so it's constantly opening, binding ions, flipping, spitting them out, binding ions, flipping, spitting them out, so that we can maintain this high concentration of sodium outside of the cell and a high concentration of potassium inside of the cell. Now, this process, this constantly binding and cha uh, conformational change to spit out the ions, this requires ATP. So this is an example of primary active transport. Primary because it's directly using ATP. So that's ac active meaning it uses ATP. Primary meaning these um, proteins themselves are directly using ATP in order to perform their function. Um, and, on the, and the one other thing I wanted to mention about this is if we think back to what uh, the components of a basal metabolic rate of like what is using energy at rest, just maintaining the amount of ATP so that we, so that these sodium potassium exchange pumps can constantly be maintaining these gradients, that is a major usage of energy when our body is just at rest. Okay, so now let's talk about how we are going to be absorbing monosaccharides across that luminal side of the intestine. So this is going to use secondary active transport. So it's going to be moving monosaccharides up their concentration gradient. So there's a higher concentration of the monosaccharides inside of the enterocyte compared to inside the lumen. So we are going to be moving, oops, 
we are going to be taking these glucose molecules and moving them up their concentration gradient to get inside the lumen of the cell. Now this is um, the, the specific transporter that we're going to use is called a sodium glucose linked transporter. And the way this transporter works is it will be open towards the lumen, towards the outside of the cell. It will bind um, two sodiums and one glucose. It will then undergo a conformational change so we can spit the glucose and two sodiums out inside the cell. Now, why is this secondary active transport? It's because it is using the concentration gradient of sodium. So remember that there's a high concentration of sodium outside of the cell and a low concentration of sodium inside of the cell. So the sodium ions, they want to get inside of the cell. That would be the sodium ions going down their concentration gradient. So what we are doing is we are using the drive of the sodium ions going down their concentration gradient in order to bring along the glucose. So that we can bring along the glucose and uh, absorb it into the enterocyte. So that is why it is secondary active transport. It's relying on the gradient that was made by the sodium potassium exchange pump. That sodium potassium ex exchange pump was directly using ATP. In this case, with this SGLT1, we're not directly using ATP in order to um, perform these actions, but it's relying on the gradients that were uh, generated from the sodium potassium exchange pump, which did use ATP. So this is secondary active transport. Now, this SGLT1 transporter is what we use for both glucose as well as for galactose. Um, fructose, however, it uses a different method to get absorbed across the luminal side of the cell. Okay, now let's talk about how we get um, our monosaccharides across the basolateral side of the cell. So in this case, we're going to be using a different kind of protein transporter that is called, um, that is involved in facilitated diffusion. So the way these transporters work is um, they will, the transporter will be open to the inside of the cell. It will bind the monosaccharide. Once it has bound the monosaccharide, it will then, it will then undergo a conformational shift and spit that monosaccharide out the basolateral side of the cell. Um, now this is called facilitated diffusion because the uh, glucose is going to be traveling down its concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, which would be what the glucose wants to do anyways when we're talking about equilibrium and concentration gradients. Um, however, the glucose can't get across the membrane by itself, so it needs a little bit of help, it needs some facilitation. Um, and so that is what this uh, transporter is doing, facilitated diffusion to help the monosaccharides travel down their concentration gradient. Now there is no energy required here because the, um, the monosaccharides are traveling down their concentration gradient. Now what are these transporters called? They're, this is a whole family of transporters called uh, glutes glucose transporters. And glutes come in many different forms, and we'll continue to talk about these throughout our mini series today. Um, glute 2 is the uh, glucose transporter that glucose and galactose can use. And so in this picture here, we see glute 2, which is allowing glucose to travel across the basolateral side of the membrane. Um, and then fructose has, a, has some different glutes. So fructose, in order for us to absorb fructose across the luminal side of the intestine, it uses a glute 5. So this is a different type of transporter that we have along the luminal side of the um, enterocyte that allows us to absorb fructose. That's through glute 5. And then when we're absorbing fructose across this basolateral side of the enterocyte, it can also use the same transporter as glucose and galactose. So fructose can also exit the basolateral side through glute 2. And then once the monosaccharides have exited the basolateral side of the cell, they can just um, diffuse directly into the, uh, into the blood vessel. Okay, so here is a summary of how we absorb monosaccharides across the enterocyte. So first, let me remind you that along this brush border of the intestine that we have a series of enzymes that can help digest or hydrolyze our disaccharides and our dextrins into their monosaccharide forms. Once we have our monosaccharide forms, that is the form that we can actually digest across the luminal and basolateral side of the enterocyte. Before we jump into the nitty gritty of how that happens, I want to remind you that 
um, we have to rely on this sodium potassium exchange pump. Remember the sodium potassium exchange pump is going to be helping us maintain a high concentration of sodium ions outside of the cell, represented in purple, and a high concentration of potassium ions inside of the cell, represented by these teal triangles. Now, uh, in this image, I'm just kind of showing you one transporter or one enzyme per enterocyte, but that's just for simplicity. The reality is that each of these enterocytes would have a whole slew of transporters and have a whole slew of sodium potassium pumps on them. Okay, so we, we have been reminded that we have this high concentration of sodium outside of the cell, high concentration of potassium inside of the cell. Now let's take a look at how we can absorb glucose across the enterocyte. So glucose is gonna rely on this sodium glucose linked transporter one, SGLT1. SGLT1 is going to bind two sodium ions and one glucose molecule. It is then going to undergo a conformational change to spit those out into the inside of the cell. And this is a type of secondary active transport because it is relying on the sodium gradient. Remember that sodium gradient was, um, is maintained by the sodium potassium pump that directly uses ATP. So the SGLT1 um, is a secondary active transport relying on the sodium gradient. Same story for galactose. So over here I'm showing you galactose. Galactose is also absorbed across the luminal side of the enterocyte using this SGLT1 transporter. Okay, then in order to get fructose across the luminal side of the intestine, we are going to use a different transporter. This is a GLUT5. So GLUT5 is a facilitated type of facilitated diffusion. It will bind uh, fructose on the outside and then undergo a conformational change so that fructose will enter the inside of the enterocyte. And then once those monosaccharides are inside the enterocyte, in order for them to travel across the basolateral side, they can all be transported out using this GLUT2 transporter. So again, this is facilitated diffusion um, where the monosaccharides are traveling down their concentration gradients. And then from there, those monosaccharides will, can just, um, are, the blood vessel is permeable to these monosaccharides. So they will just directly, whoops, enter the blood vessel and then continue on through the blood. So what happens next? We have our monosaccharides in our bloodstream. That bloodstream is going to directly go to the liver. And this is through something called the portal circulation. So in this image, what I'm showing you here is that all of the blood vessels that were innervating, or part, not innervating, all the blood vessels that were um, absorbing from the intestines, they are all gonna drain into this portal vein, which goes directly to the liver. So the liver is getting the first pass of monosaccharides that we absorbed from our food. And so the liver will keep some and it will spit out others that will continue through the rest of the circulation. Now, one way that we can, that we can understand more about this absorption of monosaccharides is looking at what happens when things go wrong. So here's an example of a condition called glucose galactose malabsorption. This is a very rare inborn, uh, a rare genetic condition that causes um, a mutation in the SGLT1 transporter. So remember that SGLT1 is required in order to absorb glucose and galactose across the luminal side of the enterocyte. Um, so in, in uh, babies who have this, uh, who have glucose galactose malabsorption, they will get really watery diarrhea and it can be lethal if not treated. Um, so the watery diarrhea is because they can't absorb the glucose and galactose so that those two monosaccharides will continue to travel down through the intestine and through the colon, which, and having that high concentration of solutes in the colon is gonna prevent water reabsorption in the colon. Um, additionally, it's gonna be lethal because they're not able to get energy from the milk sugar, from the lactose, which is glucose and galactose. That is um, the primary source of energy in their diet. So the way that it is treated is by removing lactose, removing sucrose and glucose from the diet, and then replacing it with fructose. So that is an example that demonstrates the importance of this SGLT1 transporter in absorption of glucose and galactose and in absorption of carbohydrates from the diet.